All right, so in the essence of time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Again, thank you for coming to our seventh installment of the Amgen Biotech Experience Teacher Roundtable Series. I am Dr. Candace Johnson, and I am um, a technical advisor for the ABE program office. And it's a pleasure for me to step in and guest host this roundtable um, today, as um, Jess usually does this, but she has a, a a previous um, engagement. So today I'm going to be stepping in just to facilitate this conversations um, and um, help our presenters um, share their experiences um, with ABE with you all. So as many of you know, these sessions were originally designed to specifically for our ABE um, Master Teacher Fellows, but this year we wanted to open them up to um, the entire ABE teacher community from around the world. And this is just a chance for them to also learn from the experts and each other about the topics of specific interests to science and um, to biotechnology teachers. So we hope that you've been finding this series very, very valuable. And feel free to tag us in any social media posts that you want to share um, your thoughts. And um, the tag is at ABE Prog Office. So ABE P R O G O F F I C E. So um, as usual, this roundtable will be recorded and posted on our website. So um, those who weren't able to attend um, today live will um, receive a transcript and also the video of this and all of the discussion materials that um, will be reviewed today as well. So we will have time for audience questions at the end of the presentation. So of course, we encourage you to keep notes. Um, and um, if you can't keep track of your question in your head, of course, you could um, throw it in the chat box and I'll um, try to keep track of that also and um, hopefully facilitate any question asking that we end, uh, that we have, sorry. Um, so again, today I'm glad to share that we have two um, wonderful ABE Master Teacher Fellows that I know personally here to, um, to share their experiences with you. And they re represent um, the ABE Puerto Rico site and also ABE San Diego teacher communities. So today they will share with you the community benefits of citizen science and also the challenges that they have faced as well as successful strategies that they have used to get students involved in these real world science projects and also provide us with a few examples of citizen science projects that um, are happening in their own classrooms. So without me taking up any more time, I would like to give a brief introduction um, of both of our master teacher fellows. So um, Mr. Gian Toyos has a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in natural resources management. And after working for 15 years as a wildlife biologist with marine animals, Gian has spent the last 20 years teaching high school level courses in the field of life sciences. So Gian is a member of this year's ABE Master Teacher Fellowship and again joins us from the ABE Puerto Rico site. So thank you again for joining us and sharing with us, Gian. And Miss, <laughs> thank you. And Miss Lisa Yoneda has a is a biology and biotechnology teacher at Mira Mesa High School. And she has created a biotechnology course that is now a three-year pathway. So Lisa is also the Science Bridge Coordinator and facilitates both ABE teacher and student laboratory engagement and learning in the classroom. And Lisa was a member of last year's very first cohort of Master Teacher Fellows. And her curriculum project, which she will be sharing with us today, um, is on species diversity barcoding. So again, welcome Lisa and thank you both so much for um, sharing us today. So to begin the discussion, Gian, I'm going to start with you. So if you could spend about five minutes telling us a little bit more about your role in the classroom and about the student population that you teach. And please tell us a little more about your um, how citizen um, science um, fits into your classroom design and why you think um, incorporating citizen science into your classroom is important. 
So hello everyone. Thank you again for the for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, I've been teaching for for close to twenty years now or twenty years, um, uh, different life science courses, uh, not only biology but uh, marine biology, anatomy, forensic science, and in those courses I have included the ABE resources. Uh, the school I work. John, you froze. Uh, I you froze for me for about um, fifteen okay. seconds. So if you could just back up about one second, one sentence for us, please, and then continue. Okay. So, yeah, my, let, you know what? Let me. Lisa, how, how's your connection? I just realized. I'm, do you want to go ahead and 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 start? Sure. Yeah, I can talk a little bit while you get that connection, right? It's always trying to get these connections. <laughs> uh, so I'm Lisa Anetta, and I teach in San Diego at Mira Mesa High School. Um, I've been teaching at the high school for just over 20 years, I'm teaching uh, biology all levels from freshman to AP biology. Um, and I've taught every variation of biology, um, advanced AP uh, AP environmental science, um, and then about a little over 15 years ago, I started the biotechnology program. We started as one class, <laughs> one year, and I've grown it to a full two-year program. And then the third year, um, the kids that can continue can do a research project. So, um, and the, you know, I, I feel um, the population I work with, we're a very diverse community. Um, and I love that about our community. Um, we're extremely diverse. So we have um, kids from all backgrounds. Um, and a lot of the kids are going to be first year college, um, you know, first generation college students. Um, and so with a lot of the citizen science and the A program and stuff, I can give them those kind of hands-on and that access to what's the next level going to be like and what are some of those experiences and, and combining those Abe with the citizen um, science, I think does a really good um, job of that. Um, let's see. Um, so citizen science overall to me is any way that students can kind of contribute to um, the science community, be it traditionally where they're um, submitting data by doing kind of collection things or um, by doing more advanced research work and, you know, under not just adding to the knowledge, but actually um, sharing that research and being part of the scientific community on a larger part um, and supporting um, science education and, and advancing science knowledge. And, and so to me, citizen science is that place where we can connect the two, right? I can connect what we're doing in the classroom um, with what it, they see in their real lives, with what they see in the news and here in that. And so it's a great way to not only pull kids in, but also to show them how school connects, right, to their other interests or things they see around them. And that just automatically, you get a lot of buy-in um, from that and kids get excited um, and wanna be part of that. Um, and so that's why I love it. <laughs> so to follow up with you, um, Lisa, and with that connection with using that citizen science is a connection between the classroom and real life. Um, do you have, and I only have this question because you're supposed to speak after Gian, but while I'm here, do you have any um, specific instances of um, a student blossoming from that connection using citizen um, science from the class, your classroom to the real world? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, with citizen sciences to really get it going you sponsor a lot of leadership um and so i see a lot within the classroom as far as student leaders kids really um blossoming and like taking control and understanding not just their specific role but how it fits all together um and then beyond the classroom i you know i've been now teaching long enough that i get kids come back um and are like hey that was so great i was able to apply towards this i'm applying towards internships 
uh, two of my favorites, um, one of my um, citizen science, I've been running a long time and I use grad, grad students from UC San Diego um, to help me run that program. And one of my kids that graduated years and years ago is now a grad student at UCSD. And so he's one of my grad mentors. Um, and he's like, yeah, that's how I got into research and, and that. Um, and then I had a junior once who got an internship at a local biotech over the summer and they hired her on for a senior year. So she couldn't take my class the second year. That was unfortunate, um, but they hired her on to continue during the school year so that she could train college graduates on how to work in the lab. So, you know. <laughs> That's spectacular. Yeah, yeah, those full circuit circle moments are, um, are always spectacular. And I'm just glad you, been around long enough and appreciate you being around long enough in the in the teacher community to be able to experience um, the, those full circuit mo circle moments for your um, for your students. Um, John, were you able to? Okay, so um, if you could go ahead and share with us um, a little bit about the citizen science that's going on in your classroom. So yeah, I, hopefully now it works. Um, uh, like I was saying, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it was a small school. It has grown in the last few years, uh, and our community or our students is a college prep. So all of them eventually go to college and 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 follow different degrees. Uh, most many of them, when they when they reach the biology class, the life sciences class, they're interested in science, but they say, yeah, I want to study medicine. So in part, my my my. Something that I try to do is to expose them to other fields rather, rather than just medicine. That's not the only science that there is. You know, research, conservation, ecology, uh, marine resources, which I specialize on. So I try to do that. And the way I do that is by, by integrating then these type of activities that, that you know, open their eyes and, and, and exposes them to to these different uh, areas that maybe they're not, they don't know they can actually go into, right? Or maybe they don't even know that they exist. Uh, and then uh, some, some of these students, uh, I take the opportunity, sometimes they're looking for maybe volunteer work and they need the community service hours. So I also try to combine, okay, if you need this, why don't we, and you like science, why don't, you, why don't we combine this? And, and I have worked, you know, with with uh, with different uh, uh, either our own projects as as an advisor of different clubs. I had the, the science club, recycling club, the hydroponics club, uh, or I, I make contact with with NGOs, local and non government organizations that they they look for people uh, uh, to help with their projects. And I have found a few of them that they they that's what they do. They collect data. Right? They collect data. And they use this data for for different purposes. I have a you know my I've been doing a project for for many years. If I can, I'm going to sh share this screen for a moment, which is a um, a, a beach cleanup right that we've been doing for more than than ten years. This is uh, organized by Ocean Conservancy at, at the international level, and a local organization here, Scuba Dogs organizes it, uh, but what I like about this, I'm not a big fan of beach cleanups. What's interesting is that what you see, you see maybe some students here writing down what they're collecting. So before they put any item in a trash bag, they, they tally what they have. And then at the end, the, the, you know, our group and then all the groups on the island and, and all the groups internationally put all these together and it's valuable information that the organization uses to create awareness, to help with uh, uh, passing uh, uh, laws or, or you know, legislation regarding conservation. So it's something that, that I have done you know, in different ways. We have, this is a, a again, it's a, an NGO uh, that organizes this. Uh, it also, it's a, an actual sanctuary, the Electuario de la Bahia de San Juan, that also uh, helps organize this. And then for the students that that you know this is a, a bit more um, a bit more uh, not reachable for everyone because it is it, it is expensive, but I have been able to offer opportunities internationally, like I've taken students to Galapagos and Costa Rica, Mexico, 
to work with this organization that uses students to collect scientific data that also is passed to researchers. And in this case, for example, we are at the breeding center of Galapagos tortoises and the kids, you know, they spend a couple of days uh, going over there, but first of all, learning, but also measuring that the baby tortoises and, and cleaning their, their cages. So we also have, a, there's another part of the project that works with the farmers. I didn't know that in Galapagos you can grow coffee. There's a big industry of coffee, but there are many invasive species affecting the, the growth. So they're helping with sustainable farming uh, and all that. So again, and this is done during the school year, right? Usually during spring break, we, we take off and, and, and go to these places. So this is, you know, it's something that I, I try to, to incorporate um, besides the curriculum uh, in my classes, is something that I try to also uh, uh, incorporate and, and, right? Wow, thank you, Gian, uh, for the yeah. share, and especially um, for those beautiful pictures, um, advantages of living and working in Puerto Rico, but um, beautiful. My one follow-up question before we get into um, our, our master teacher fellows um, presenting their, actually, their curriculum projects that they worked on, my follow-up question to you, Gian, is we see um, how you've implicated um, citizen science into your classroom and beyond, and even to the beach, but if you wouldn't mind sharing one challenge or a couple challenges that you had with using citizen science as that connection for your students between the classroom and, and the real world? Well, I, I think if you talk to any teacher, they will say time, right? Finding the right time, finding time to do all this, uh, because it's not, it's not easy, right? When, when, if you wanna take kids out of the school, should we do it after school? Should we do it during the weekend? But then they have other, I mean, students have so many other activities. So for me, that's the biggest challenge. And, and if they're not committed, like they really feel they're part of the project and, and, and also that's something I try to motivate them to make their projects and their own, uh, it, it's difficult, right? So, uh, but, but, you know, the idea is to, to plan ahead, you know, keep good communication with the administration, colleagues and letting them know, listen, we're gonna be doing this. And a biggest, uh, a, an essential force out there is our parents. Parents, you know, uh, involve parents and you will see how they, how they also like uh, do, doing that. And I also look for help with, uh, with NGOs, right? They all, maybe they already have the materials, they just need the people. So it's much easier, right? Rather than, you know, investing in, in materials or, or simply, looking for a project to do. Maybe the project is already designed and everything is out there. You just need to, to provide them with the, with the students, with the workforce. All right, yes, thank you for that, for sharing that one caveat. Of course, time is also, and I think it's probably the, the highest constraint to deal with within the classroom setting, especially when trying to get this, um, this hands-on science done. So with your brief introductions and a little bit of insight into your student populations and how um, you both are currently incorporating um, citizen science into your classroom, we're now gonna take about um, 10 minutes per presenter to um, give you a moment to specifically share um, the curriculum projects that you have been developing. Um, so for that, First, we're going to start with um, Lisa. And again, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the chat for now, or we'll save them to an end to the end um, for Lisa to discuss. Okay, let me go ahead and share the screen. I don't have great pictures or anything, but I have a few things that kind of go along with what I'm taking talking about. I'd like to see them. Um, so everybody can see that screen, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so this kind of here is kind of how I kind of rank citizen science. So I wanted to kind of just introduce kind of a starting point versus kind of jumping straight into um, these long, big, huge, long projects. Um, so really traditionally, like a lot of citizen science is designed where researchers give goals, kids are collecting data, 
um, and reporting that data, but they may or may not analyze the data. Um, and typically these are ecological or environmental studies. The nice thing about those traditional ones is it's a little easier on the teacher because it's kind of been pre-planned. You just kind of have to find a project to kind of join. Um, and they can be ongoing one time a year kind of things or just once um, kind of thing. Um, and those are really good places to start. And I would recommend starting in one of those places um, if you haven't tried before. Um, and then some of the projects I'm gonna talk about today are more kind of an expanded. So my students are actually conducting their own research. It may or may not be in conjunction with other researchers. Um, but they're putting that data out there that is available for researchers to use, okay, for their particular ones. Um, and the outcomes, right, support not just adding data, but supporting kind of the science communities and the building um, the science yeah, community as well as the knowledge. Um, and so it gives you a little more flexibility, but it also takes a lot more kind of coordination um, on there. But okay, so these are kind of the main four citizen projects that I have worked on. A um, lot of water sampling things out there for people to do. This was one I worked on for a long time um, on a specific project, right? Um, and then like digital camera traps, you can record species. The nice thing also with these is you can really integrate them. You can design lessons around them for kind of adding in, well, hey, this is why we're learning about populations. This is, you know, learning about water sampling. Why does the ecology matter? Why does what's in the water matter? Um, and then the bottom two here are kind of the two that are much more um, expanded um, and have the, so let me kind of talk about those because these kind of go together. Um, the biodiversity in San Diego is my current project um, that I'm working on with Abe kind of do that, but I am also kind of integrating it into my Science Bridge Tech site internship. So I just kind of want to give you that background here. Um, so for my Science Bridge, I've been doing this um, for about 15 years now, where my kids are actually making science kits that we donate to schools um, in San Diego. So they're free. Um, we get funding from grants and other things. Um, recently, we picked up a kind of a long term from Biocom, um, but my kids aren't so much providing data, they're providing the materials. So they're using their skills that they're learning, their science skills, like making an aliquoting reagents, micropipetting, um, to make sure that they're making the solutions correctly, QCing those, and then they put those out. And then they also write internal updates and by internal there are four of us that run these sites so these are published within our community of science bridge and so the kids see that these sops that they're writing and improving on right are reaching this larger audience to improve the science and then my second year students do a lot of the design and testing of the reagents to see, hey, what could have caused this problem that showed up with this teacher or things like that. Um, so they're doing full science re um, testing, but they are actually designing the experiments, okay, in there. And then altogether, we get give out about 200 um, kits a year. So it's, it's really cool for the kids. Um, and then part of that, we do a lot of community outreach and presentations. Those are the kits that we make. Um, and like I said, the citizen science, it reinforces those skills. Students take ownership um, and a sense of purpose. Right, and they're really adding. So this biodiversity is where I'm really excited because this is my new project and my new addition. Um, I've done biodiversity for a lot of years in my ecology units and biology, um, but where I discovered that I can really make this a citizen science is I kind of found the iNaturalist app. I found it maybe a year or two before COVID. Um, and then it kind of just dovetailed into COVID and allowed the kids to kind of get out and be part of the science. Um, even when they were at home and we were doing things online. Um, and so I just 
to introduce it, I just have the kids use the app and find native species. And they're like, wow, I didn't know that like that weed that grows in my yard is a native species. Um, and so they really kind of get into the environment. And if the kids are, are picking up good pictures, getting good GPS um, with their uh, phones or putting it in afterwards, then local and global research projects will pick up their data. Um, and you can see it being added. Sorry. <laughs> There's a bell. Um, but they can see it being added to like the San Diego Biodiversity Project that's run out of our Balboa Park and kind of things like that. Um, and then the last component that I'm adding with my biotech kids is doing this species barcoding. Um, unfortunately, it's been a little slower rollout than I would have liked um, this year with COVID dovetailing. Um, we just haven't been able to fully, fully implement this, but I've been piloting pieces of this this year. Um, and so the difference is that instead of just taking pictures and putting in the GPS for where these species are found, um, my kids are actually going to be doing uh, DNA collection. PCR and then sequencing the data um, and interpreting that data and upgrade up to, um, uploading that data to the national database on genetic species. Um, and then that will help them determine what actual species because you know there's a lot of things that we say, oh, it's that, but it could be a subspecies, right? We say that's, you know, nationwide that's the same one but locally there's a lot of different organisms and things so it's really exciting to get that to delve it in and that's where i am um so yeah piloting that still unfortunately a year later but it's it, that's where we're getting um and then i thought i'd just throw this out here if anybody's interested just kind of some ways to get um started um, some apps, and I can throw that into the chat if anybody's interested. Well, that's my project. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lisa. And again, like I threw into the chat, I love that um, your work brings in learners and learners creating learning materials to help support other learners. I think that is absolutely lovely. Um, on top of all of the great science um, that you're that you're helping out with both with education and within your um, ecology community. Um, what I do want to say is that um, Lisa's project is um, currently online and I will throw a link to that in the chat. Um, but for time's sake for now, I'm going to go ahead and ask Gian to um, share his project that he's been developing through the Master Teacher Fellowship with us right now. Okay, so uh... First of all, uh, I I am not. I mean, uh, I'm currently working uh, as a fellow, so so I haven't completed mine, and in no way I'm close to what you're doing, Lisa. <laughs> uh, you already have many things established, so uh, I I continue to 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 try to inspire students, right, to to love science and the different fields of science. So, uh, one of the things that that I have try to do is is um, contact again organizations that need support right that need support and 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 mostly volunteers or people that were like that so i've been i've been uh, in contact with a group actually two groups uh, here in puerto rico we have a problem with with in, invasive species right being an island that, that's a big problem and one of the invasive species is the lionfish a, a, it's a it's a species that is a, a, a top, you know top predator. A, it has no natural enemy on these waters. It's from from the Mediterranean Sea. That's where you find it. So here it doesn't have any enemies and it's causing havoc among a, a different ecosystems. So a, I've been in touch with some with with a couple of of organizations, and we're trying to figure out. A, what is what is it that they're eating, right? We're trying to 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 determine what if they're feeding on particular species or they're simply because it seems they eat everything. If it moves, they will eat it. So uh, you see the technique of barcoding. 
uh, we're trying to study the, the stomach contents of these fish. So uh, once we, and again, I haven't started doing it yet because everything is uh, planning stages, but the idea is to collect those, those samples, right? Uh, um, and then analyze them and extract the DNA sequence and then use the, the, the uh, you know, technology out there to determine if we can identify specific fish, uh, uh, species to help, you know, to create either more awareness or if there's any type of legislation, any type of, of, of you know, um, measure, measures that have been taken in other countries, in Florida, for example, is a big problem and that they believe the, 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 that's where it started and then move along the, the Caribbean. So that's where we are. I'm in the planning stages. The pandemic hasn't helped that much. Uh, but uh, what I would like to add is that um, uh, when I was selected for, for this fellowship, uh, first of all, I was surprised, right? And, but, but I know that this is leaving an impact on students. And, and sometimes students graduate and they leave your class or whatever, and you don't realize. But I, I wanna share with you, you know, I, I, ha I recently had two students contact me and they graduated years ago, just to tell me specifically how AB has a, a did impact them. A, was a, I mean, I, I have their names fresh in my mind because I, they wrote to me, Manuel. A, he, he, he did his PhD in Chin, U Chicago and he's doing now his a postdoc in Berkeley, California in Berkeley. And he wrote me to tell me, I used, and this was uh, some time ago, but he told me how the first year of college, he was looking for a job in, in his university and what helped him get uh, Landa a job as a lab assistant was the fact that they saw him, how he could use a micro pipette. And he said, of course, I learned that in, 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 in my biology class. And it was because, you know, we had those resources. I was able to bring those research to the resources to this classroom. So I, I you know, he, he was so appreciative of, of that and he shared that uh, with me. Uh, another student that I have, uh, uh, that, and this one literally wrote me a few months ago, Alana. Uh, she, first of all, she, she, she was a student. There, there were like three years that I was able to give a, a biotechnology course, an elective. So she was one of the students that participated in those courses, and she loved fell in love with it, right? And 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 a very shy student, but but you know, after she graduated, I I she told me how she liked it and 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 how it, she got inspired. She even published. She already has two publications about the uh, 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 the blood barrier barrier and how cells and different chemicals go through. So I was so impressed. And then she's recently wrote me uh, to tell me how she was granted a, a fellowship with NSF, an NSF graduate research. And I mean, I felt honored when she said, I had to let you know, because I talked about you on my, on my essay. Apparently they had to write, write some essay. Or, so we, uh, uh, and then I have another student, he's studying not only in the States, but here in Puerto Rico in Maya West, she's doing her pre-vet Victoria. And I'm, she's working with sustainable farming. And again, it's another student that fell in love by just being in contact with these resources and these materials, these techniques that, that the program provides. Uh, so they, they do cause an impact and they are helping so many kids out there uh, find their passion and, and go for it, right? And, and do uh, uh, what, what, it, what, they, you know, what they fell in love with. So that's basically a, a, a what I'm working on, a, the lionfish project and all that. But also, I, I love to keep inspiring students, right? I, that's that's my passion. I'm making sure that when they leave my class, they still remember, a, at least remember a, what we talked about. But if they go into it, much better. Thank you, Gian, for sharing. And yes, those beautiful pictures that you um, shared with us earlier. Um, with you know the the students and the learners working on the beach and collecting data and recording data, um, I'm, I'm I, I see how that can be a lasting memory and I'm I'm see how that can be motivation. But what I honestly heard from you was that um, the role of citizen science has introduced your students to how interdisciplinary 
that science is. So I, I heard you you inspired ecology, you 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 inspired different types of science fields to 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 go ahead and be opened up for your for your learners. Um, but yes, beautiful pictures, beautiful stories. Um, you as well, um, Lisa. So um, if either of you don't have anything more to share about your projects, I will open up a few seconds to any questions um, or comments that any students that are on, I mean, students, excuse me, teachers that are <laughs> that are on um, live with us want to share. And if you drop it into the message box, I will um, be able to share that with our speakers as well. So I'm just going to leave the floor open for a few minutes. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, Ms. Martina, yeah. we can hear you. Hi, I'm Martina. Um, I'm a Science News Civic Science Fellow, and I'm glad that um, I was able to attend. I just saw the email and I was like, I should um, check this out. So all your projects sound very, very amazing. And I come to the session as a different perspective. I'm not a teacher, um, but I'm a scientist and I'm a science communicator. Um, and also with my fellowship project, I'm interested in how to use science journalism to engage younger audiences. And at a meeting I was early at today in this meeting, I just wanted to know, what do you all think about like definitions? Like how my project is a civic science project, but then we also hear um, civic science, citizen science, community science. And that's like something that I was just thinking about all day because to me, it's like a blur in a gray area that which one is it? And I don't think it's a right or wrong answer, um, but I'm just curious to um, see what you both think. Um, I would say, you know, like I said, I think anything that adds to science knowledge, adds to kids' experiences and in going into science is a great thing. And so, you know, getting kids to observe the world around them and, and journal about it from a young age, right? Because unfortunately, science sometimes at earlier ages is often very cookie book, right? Like you follow this and you get this answer. It's not really science. <laughs> it just helps you see certain outcomes and things. And so I think journaling is a great way of getting kids kind of to see that there's other aspects of science. I, I agree. I mean, like, and like you said, there's no right or wrong. I, I think it, it depends also a uh, I mean, we have to uh, consider the cultural aspect. Like, I mean, there have been times in which I, I sell this, this event, maybe during a weekend or after school as volunteer work, right? And, and I attract students because they, they need to, to, to complete uh, service hours or, but then when they see what they're doing, I try to make that connection, right? Listen guys, what you're doing is gonna be used by other people to make decisions, to, to create conservation campaigns and things like that. So, uh, uh, you know, it depends on the area where you live uh, and, and, and the, 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 I don't know, even, even the language or, or the terms that are commonly used uh, on TV, perhaps, or, or what they read. So, so, but again, as long as you get them out there and, and in your case, as, as long as you inform them and, and they know that, okay, what we did is actually useful. It, it can be used for this or that. Uh, I mean, ha, ha, that has such a great value, right? Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I can say. And thank you for, for doing that. I mean, it's, it's great. Thank you, thank you for your, um, sharing that. Thank you, Martina, for that. And thank you, Jan and Lisa, for the follow-up. Any more questions or comments and concerns considering um, these fellows projects specifically or um, even just citizen science um, in general? If no one asks a question, I do have a follow-up question on feasibility, but again, I'll give the floor 30 seconds. So I'll ask a question. <laughs> um, if we you know, could add opportunities within ABE that would support citizen science? What kinds of things do you think would be interesting to, for us to think about? 
I, I can, I can, I'm not, I don't know if I'm gonna answer the question per se, but, but I think organizations like yours, foundations like yours, because others are doing it, are taking advantage of, for example, social media. Like sometimes I, I had the other student ask me the other day, how do you know all these things? Because I, I, I send them emails about, hey, there's a, a beach cleanup, or there's the, uh, so now that with the summer is coming, there's summer internship and all this. And I tell them, listen, I use social media productively and I'm subscribed to all these groups, institu organizations and foundations and things like that, that again, that they're looking for people, they're looking for help, they're looking for, because that's how they survive. They don't have the money to pay or they, have, they don't have the, the funds to, to, to pay. And, and you can take advantage and uh, you know, our students can take advantage of that, gain experience, I tell them, this is how you really know if you're passionate about something. Maybe you, you volunteer for something and say, oh my God, this is not mine. This is not for me. So, and it, and it happened to me. I mean, I wanted to be a vet. I volunteered at a vet clinic and I couldn't deal with the owners. So I, I went in and work, into the, I work, work in the field. So I think organizations like yours can, uh, like, like, like the project that you just posted, that Lisa's project, if you can promote those, on your social platforms, that would be awesome. I mean, because again, that, that's my main source of opportunity for my students. Uh, I, 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 today I got an email asking me for a letter of recommendation of a student that is applying for a summer a program uh, uh, with coral reefs. And it, it was an opportunity I found online here in Puerto Rico. So I think that might be something very helpful. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like promoting where kids can actually get involved with the resources and things or teachers um, is a great place um, to be active for, for the Amgen and AB Foundation. Um, but also, you know, potentially um, I feel like my project and, you know, what Jean is doing and things like that, having access and support and continuing support those um, eventually could lead to more citizen science being done in classrooms. Thank you for that question, Rebecca, and thank you for your um, um, reply. My, um, I guess, Lisa's um, last comment to Rebecca's question, um, I'm just always thinking about feasibility with teachers in the classrooms. And again, you both are using um, the citizen science as a connector in the middle between the classroom and the, the learner's future and even just the, the, the world population in general. And it just seems that you guys have been able to make those connections by utilizing the local university or just citizen science projects that you, Gian, researched yourself and just became aware about and knew that you can um, contribute. Um, so if we could just, each one of you just briefly um, mention any um, woes about like feasibility and also try to give us a little bit of inspiration that though making these connections can be a little um, um, hard, um, they're still clearly possible. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start on that one. Um, you know, like I said um, in my presentation, don't start with the big, huge projects. Start with little pieces, right? Start with the pre-planned projects. Um, CitizenScience.gov and NaturalGeographic.org has ones where you can just like that day you do that activity. And like I said, once you kind of find an activity that works for you, you're gonna see hey, I can connect this to this lesson and I can connect it to this. And it becomes part of the whole model of how you teach that class. Um, and that's where the kids get that buy-in and they get that excitement and they naturally want to do more with it. And then you're ready to take that next step, right, um, with that. And as you work with those organizations, you start making those connections of, hey, I'm interested in this and I'm in this community and you start getting those. Um, because once you get to the big projects, you absolutely need to coordinate and work with others. It's not just you. Um, you can't just make it all happen. Um, if for no other reason than funding and, and availability and who needs the data. Um, and so don't be afraid to start small um, and, and to work with those and find something that you think is interesting and can connect. 
um, and then kind of work from there. And, you know, feel free to contact me if you have questions and, uh, you know, I'm happy to help you um, get on your way. I, I agree. There's either I can, a little I can add to that. I mean, the only the only thing I can say is that uh, with, with the technology we have today, that they can make this, you know, that the fact that they're they're collecting data without realizing that they can do it on every day. Like right now, I was looking at my phone because I have a bunch of apps where you can document. You know, I have one for jellyfish. I mean, who has that? But there are, there are apps out there that want people that if you see a jellyfish, take a picture of it. And, and you know how many how many of these kids spend so much time at the beach or in, in boats or things like that, at least in Puerto Rico. But but uh, same thing with birds, uh, with, with flowers, with plants, and they have it on their phone. So it, 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 who knows, instead of just going to Instagram or any, oh, look, a flower, I wanna take a picture and post it here. And, and you, the thing is they're helping someone. Someone at the other end of that application, their app, is receiving that information, telling me that this species of flower was found here, and who knows what might lead up to. So uh, I, think, I think with all the research we have today, there's so much that, that can be done. I love hearing that. Again, another interdisciplinary connection. So not just the hands-on, um, you know, the core ABE biotechnology that um, these learners are getting to experience just by starting with that, with that foundation of ABE and you master teachers fellows building off of that. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just amazing to hear what other scientific and non-scientific disciplines um, your learners are being um, exposed to and are able to engage with. Um, I do see a comment or a question from Ms. Martina in um, the chat, and I'm guessing this is directed towards Gian, but she's asking, how do the students share their work? Wow, that, that's something I definitely need, need to work on. Uh, mostly it stays in my classroom, which, with it, which is a shame, right? Uh, I have tried to find, I know there are journals out there that are targeted towards a high school students. A, ours is a school that is, is very challenging. The, the curriculum is very demanding. And I honestly have not found a way to incorporate that yet because of, again, time. But for example, here they, they have, a, they, in, they teach the AP Capstone a course. And, and I think it is, it's in the English department but that's a course that applies to any discipline. And I have so, I mean, I had, I don't know, five over the, I don't know how many years it's been, but I, I, I in the, not the advice, I, the mentor, the mentor is the word that they use. I, I mentor a couple of students that wanted to focus on, one was on genetics, the other one was on a, a, a global warming and things like that. So, I, uh, that's something that I'm working on and seeing if I can incorporate that into at least making it into that type of project, Capstone. And from there, you know, if they, if they really go through, there's a, a or, or they really develop and they're happy with the, with, the, with the results, then we can move on to maybe perhaps find a, a place for, uh, to publish. Uh, no, no, and, and it doesn't have to be a scientific publication. It can be a magazine, thing, something like that. But honestly, that's something I have not worked on that much. But I know it's something that I definitely would love to, to, to improve. I love the way the students also feel part of a bigger community and they see firsthand, you know, there's a larger scientific community and they see the importance of both of you building networks um, because I think that's a really important part of you know, scientific research, or indeed whatever career they go into, it's their important attributes. Um, to add on to how to share their work, I would also say like if it's journals and things, um, a website could be appropriate for that, right? And and people will find it and, and start linking to it and so. I, I created my, I have an Instagram account and I tried to make it very nerdy and I think it was too, too nerdy that, that I scared them. But I wanted them to, to, to answer questions and things like that. It didn't work, but I tried, 
pero I, I, I haven't given up. I keep posting every now and then. But yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a magazine or something big. It can be something as simple as the school website or something like that, definitely. Yeah, I was about to say, I would love to like see, I just love like seeing um, young scientists or budding scientists like just doing their work. And I'm just like, if I was in high school, I didn't know all these things that people could do now. And I would want to like share that. Um, so that's the reason I had the question. And then maybe if they do like um, like a TikTok or Instagram or something, because, you know, like, like you said, they always on their phones. Um, so why not share it? Like you can get a scholarship from that. You never know. Um, but I would just love to, I agree, I want to like see that Instagram, Twitter, because I'll follow. Yeah, you, you have my, my, my Instagram name there. Uh, and, and I was, um, you know, in, in our department, we had a, a chat among the teachers and uh, we shared things like that. And I recently shared a post. There's so many, you know, so, these called so-called influencers, but that they're scientists. And what they're doing is sharing science and, and posting questions that even, I mean, the last one that I posted, it was about physics. And the physics teachers basically gave me a gave me a refresher or a concept of water displacement. And if these people are posting this, then the, it means that the that the students can actually uh, you know can also see this. And and if you bring that to class, hey, who saw this? For, you know, you you follow this person or not? Uh, uh, there, there, there's there's so much that 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 can be done with that also. All right. Well, thank you for everybody for sharing. Thank you, Martina, for that um, great question, which sparked our um, final discussion of students share. How do they share their work with each other? Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, but if there aren't any more questions, we're going to go ahead and wrap up for this meeting. So again, I just like to thank you for attending our seventh roundtable. Um, that was based on citizen science and a special thank you again to our presenters, Lisa and Gian for telling us about the amazing work um, that they've been doing. Thank you for attending who those who attended live and joined in our discussion as well and um, look forward to seeing you in the next meeting. All right, everybody have a good thank rest of your much. day, depending on your time zone. <laughs>